So, we have been discussing about uh, multidimensional NMR methods, we discussed the different types of 2D correlation experiments and last time we also talked about the heteronuclear experiments and uh, I want to show you some of those spectra and illustrate how these heteronuclear experiments are extremely useful, how we take it forward to three dimension, four dimensional experiments as we also mentioned earlier, but we will elaborate on that one as we go along different kinds of experiments are uh, can be done. Now, one of those uh, which was most crucial experiment in this uh, endeavor was the so called HSQC heteronuclear single quantum correlation experiment and that is HSQC and uh, to this one what I am showing here is the so called proton N15 HSQC. of a protein which is labeled as FKBP. Okay. It is a small protein of about 90 residues and uh, you can see here uh, peaks coming from the individual amino acids as they are labeled here. You can see the various amino acids are labeled with their one letter code. So, for example, there is a glycine here, there is glycines here, all these are glycine, then you have a serine here, glycine, G, glycine, valine and incidentally these peaks which are coming here these are coming from the side chains, side chains of glutamines and asparagines. Side chains also have the NH2 groups, CONH2 groups of so the glutamines and asparagines have the CONH2 group in the side chain and they also produce peaks here and they appear as pairs here. So, whereas the, all the other peaks which are appearing here, these are from the backbone of the protein and you can get this one peak per residue. I mean every amide proton has a connection to its own N15. Therefore, you can see here such a good um, uh, distribution of the peaks. This is one of the very well behaved, very well folded proteins. Now, if you can imagine here how this experiment has been extremely useful. See, suppose you were to take a projection here, take a cross section at a particular NH position. In the proton spectrum, how would it look like? Suppose I were to take the amide proton at this chemical shift. Okay, And you see how many peaks are here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 so many amide protons are present at this particular position. This is what I illustrated to you last time that when the so many amides are present they will all come at the same line in your correlation spectrum of the toxi or the nosy and things like that. But now you see all of these amino acids have different N15 chemical shifts and therefore they get separated here on this particular N15 axis here. Similarly, if you took here there are so many amide protons at the same NH chemical shift and they have fortunately they have different N15 chemical shifts. Of course, similarly if you were to take the particular N15 chemical shift somewhere for example here, so then you will see so many N15s at the same point. So, you have here suppose I took this, you have this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this so many N15s at the same point N15 chemical shift but then they have different amide proton chemical shifts. Therefore, they get separated out quite distinctly in this two dimensional correlation spectrum. Amide proton N15 correlation spectrum that is why it is called as heteronuclear single quantum correlation spectrum. Therefore, since you are able to count here the number of peaks distinctly uh, one for each residue, this the number of peaks will be almost equal to the number of residues in your protein barring prolines. The prolines do not have the amide protons therefore you will not show those cross peaks. And therefore this experiment is called as the fingerprint fingerprint of the protein with regard to its primary structure that is the amino acid sequence fingerprint of the protein with regard to the primary structure. You can just count the number of peaks here. First of all, you count the number of peaks to find out whether you have got your protein properly or not or there something else is happening. If there is aggregation going on in your protein, then you will see that some number of peaks will not be the same, some peaks do not appear. Then this will also give an indication as to what is happening in your protein, whether the protein is aggregating. And if it is aggregating there will be only few peaks which will be seen and these will correspond to the, the, the flexible portions of the aggregate. 
Therefore, this also you make use of to find out the status of the protein in your solution. And then of course, you have to devise uh, conditions how to break these aggregates and how to get single thing. And this is what extremely is a useful technique and we will sh show you how this has been used to identify or determine the folding pathways in proteins or aggregation pathways in proteins. This also has been extremely very well character useful procedure for this. Now of course, what you need for this? You need uh, a labeled protein. So, you need here a N15 labeled protein. You cannot do this in uh, at natural abundance and in fact this is how this was these experiments were not done earlier when the methods were not available for labeling the proteins. N15 labeled proteins are required for this and this is now possible because of the recombinant technology. You can produce this protein inside E. coli uh, bacteria and you can put your gene of interest as kind of a construction construct and the protein will be expressed in the cell. You feed the bacteria with ammonium chloride which is N15 labeled and then it will and no other source of the nitrogen uh, in that one. Then it will incorporate the amino acid uh, N15 in every amino acid it synthesizes and then in, the, in the every protein it synthesizes. Therefore, you will naturally get N15 labeled protein from the bacteria, you will use a biological machinery to label this uh, protein with N15 and then of course, you will have to devise methods of purifying your recombinant protein and then uh, uh, record the NMR spectra. Okay. So, now having done that, so you as I, we also discussed earlier that we can make use of this strategy and combine this with the uh, other um, 2D experiments like the TOXI and the NOSI. The HSQC spectra gave you only the amide proton chemical shifts. It identified the amide proton chemical shifts and the N15 chemical shifts. But the amino acids have other uh, protons as well along the side chains and along the backbone, the alpha protons, the beta protons, the gamma protons and things like that. So therefore, you should be able to identify those ones and also if you are going into the structural part, then you must be able to identify which protons are close by and this is what is done by these particular kinds of experiments where you have this HSQC part from here, HSQC which we had discussed earlier, this is the HSQC part, you combine this with the toxic spectrum here, toxic spectrum, this is the toxic mixing sequence, okay. until here it is the HSQC up till here, then you mix, combine with the toxic part here and then you record the spectrum in T2. Therefore, what will appear along the T1 axis? The T1 axis the information that is present is the N15 okay, or the C13 here in the case C13 as a pulse sequence is written but the same thing is true for the N15 as well. So therefore, you can this will be the carbon 13 chemical shifts or this N15 chemical shifts in the case of proteins but in other molecules you can do carbon 13 chemical shifts here I will show you some examples of this one. Then after this toxic you can record this spectrum. What happens during the toxic period? The magnetization which has come back on a particular starting uh, proton will get relayed to other protons through the toxic mixing. So this toxic mixing relays as we discussed before to other protons through the sequence. Therefore, at a particular carbon 13 you will see all this uh, protons which are connected in the network. Okay. Similarly, in this particular example until here you have then HSQC spectrum. So, the C13 proton correlation here and then after this, this portion which is added here, this is the nosy. So, you have the mixing time here, the tau m is the nosy mixing time. So, during this period you have the transfer of information happening the between the protons which are close by in space. Okay. Or if there is a chemical exchange happening, that also can be happening here. So, whichever process is happening, you will see correlations for those particular protons. Therefore, this has a structural input. So, while this is a useful for identifying the spin systems, the assignments, this has a structural input. It also has input from the point of view of assignments because the near neighbor interactions will provide you the assignments and it will also provide you the structural information as uh, in your uh, depending upon the molecule what you have. Okay. Let us see here is an example here. So, here is an example of a small molecule. This is trichinine, this is some kind of a drug I guess. So, this is a molecule which has been investigated in detail. So, it is a very complex molecule. 
So you have so many protons here, all the protons are numbered here. See you have 21, 22, so many protons are, there is a carbons, okay, these are all carbons. So many carbons are there and is starting from 1 here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay, so many carbons are present in this molecule and there are correspondingly so many different protons. Now to determine the structure of this, to assign this individual spectrum, it is extremely complex. So we look at this chemical shift, this is the one dimensional spectrum of this molecule. So you have so many peaks here, of course this is the same here as well. And this side is the HSQC toxi spectrum, this is the HSQC nosy spectrum, okay. There is a big difference between these two. And you can see here the ones which are the dark ones here, focus on the dark ones here, the red black peaks, these are the HSQC peaks alone. These are just the HSQC peaks, okay. These correspond, you can count here the number of peaks, this will correspond to the number of carbons you have in your molecule. So each one of them here corresponds to one particular carbon, each peak corresponds to one particular carbon and you have here the number of peaks which are equivalent to the number of uh, peaks in uh, carbons in your molecule. Of course, if you have a quaternary carbon that will not show up here because wherever there is a proton attached to the carbon, only that carbon will show up here. So you can have as many carbons identified there. Now what you do at the same carbon positions, you see this toxic. So you have the whole range of protons which are attached, okay. So from here to here there are so many protons which are connected to that. So you have different carbons there and from the carbons you have a relay to the protons which are attached. Therefore you can identify the, uh, the uh, protons which are connected to these carbons, okay. So you see here these are ones which are connected in the coupling, in the network. Can I, you can look at these peaks here, so which are the ones which are connected. Okay. The numbers are indicated here. So this assignment has come as the result of analysis of this spectra. So you have the carbons and you have the connected protons to them and you go to the next carbon which is connected to that. And then you walk through the spectrum to identify the entire network of carbons which are connected to each other. So that is how you get a sequential walk or a walk through the spectrum, through the toxic spectrum to identify the various uh, carbons in your molecule. Okay, what about this? <clears throat> this peak here, you see, you have the HSQC spectrum which are black and the nosy peaks which are present here, these are appearing in red. The red means they have a negative peaks. These are negative peaks. Why are these negative? Nosy because this is a small molecule. You remember in a small molecule which is less than few hundred um, uh, molecular weights or few hundred molecular weights, the tumbling is extremely rapid. In those cases, the NOE is positive. If the NOE is positive, in the two dimensional spectrum, it will appear as a negative peak, whereas the diagonal or not the diagonal, the self peaks appear positive and the NOE peaks will appear as negative. Therefore, you can clearly distinguish which are the NOE peaks and which are the self peaks here. That is why I said all these black ones are the self peaks of the individual carbon proton correlations. It will tell you how many carbons are there in a particular carbon chemical shift and from those carbons you have a NOEs to the proton, protons. So what does that tell you? That means these protons are having um, uh, correlation through the distance dipolar distance and therefore you can identify using this you can figure out which protons are close by here because the NOE can happen between the protons and protons. We are talking about proton proton NOE, we are not talking about carbon proton NOE, we are talking about proton proton NOE. So let me let me go back to this experiment here, you see the magnetization at this point is on proton, magnetization is on proton. So therefore we are talking about the proton proton NOE. Okay. So therefore, when I uh, see here, so the NOEs which are happening are between the protons. If I have carbon here, it is attached to a proton and it shows NOE to uh, another proton and it is attached to a different carbon, then you will see that sort of a correlation here. We can walk through the, walk through the carbon chain here from the uh, proton proton correlations appear in a particular carbon chemical structure. This is just to illustrate how these experiments are useful for arriving at the assignments on the one hand and the structure of the molecule on the other hand, okay. So now you can see you appreciate this better the how we can make use of 
three, three dimensional experiment. Now we talked about the two dimensional experiments. We said at a particular, I explained to you earlier, at a particular amine proton chemical shift there are so many uh, amino acids here. So many, therefore you are seeing so many chemical shifts, so many uh, peaks here. Okay? This may be a toxic spectrum, this may be an OE spectrum, whatever. So you have so many peaks here at a particular end proton chemical shift. Now if you look at the proton N15 correlation spectrum, you are seeing 3 N15s. Therefore, there are at least 3 or certainly 3 because there are only 3 peaks there. So, you have 3 peaks which are present here and now you do what you do is instead of making a just a 2 dimensional spectrum HSQC spectrum, HSQC toxi or something like that, instead of spreading them along the proton axis, extending the proton axis here like that, we actually pull this spectrum along this axis here. In the 2 dimensional spectrum what we did we would actually pull this in the HSQC toxi or HSQC nosy to include the proton chemical shifts more here. But now we will restrict that um, to N50 the amide chemical shifts only but we will take the third axis to pull these peaks onto the different dimension the N15 dimension here. So therefore all these peaks will now get distributed into the different planes in the 3 dimensional spectrum. Now if you need further resolution you can make use of the carbon 13 here then of course you will go into the 4D experiment and this will be quite a substantial thing to do. Now if you want to do carbon 13 then you will have to have a carbon 13 labeling as well. This also can be done using the bacteria and um, uh, use carbon 13 labeled glucose and you will get uh, C13 N15 labeled protein. Here is a typical example of a 3 dimensional spectrum. Here axes are not labeled with anything but I already showed you yesterday that uh, in the previous class then you can have whatever nuclei you want here you can have. You can have 2 proton axis or 1 carbon axis, 2 proton axis or 1 nitrogen axis or 1 proton axis, 1 nitrogen axis and 1 carbon axis. So you can have all three different kinds of combinations there. So now the peaks are distributed in a volume in a cuboid rather than on a plane. Therefore, you take cross sections at various places, you will be able to figure out what sort of a spectrum you will get, what is the information present in your spectrum. Okay. Now, we go to the next stage, we go to the next stage what are called as triple resonance experiments. So far we are talking about two dimensional experiments or three dimensional experiments where there were only two nuclei, one was the proton, other one was the nitrogen. Now, you can have three different nuclei also right as I mentioned you can have proton, nitrogen and carbon. What does this require? This requires different kind of a treatment. You need to have three different channels. You need to have three different channels. I will write this on the next slide here. So in your, this is the same slide given in the white background. So that you some only, only some experiments have been selected here. So you need to have in your spectrometer you need to have a proton channel, a carbon channel and a nitrogen channel. So you need to be able to apply pulses along the three different channels. Okay. So you apply various pulses there, you apply various pulses and how it will and obviously finally you actually collect the data only on the proton channel. So in between the magnetization flows to through different ones which I will explain to you. Now we take one by one and see how this works. Okay. Let us look at this particular experiment which is called as the HNCA. What does this represent? This experiment represents that along one axis you have the proton, okay. this is proton and along the second axis you have the carbon, these are the C alpha carbons and on the third axis you have the nitrogen. The red ones are the nuclei which you are going to see in a three dimensional experiment. That is why these are called as triple resonance experiments because you are making use of proton, nitrogen and carbon, three different channels. Okay? And these experiments were described uh, way back in the 1990s uh, by different group authors here. So I have listed those references here for uh, quick uh, reference seeing through that. Now this experiment starts from the proton here and the magnetization is transferred, you see how this is manipulated you manipulate the transfer pathway of the uh, pulse sequence. You go from here to here, here to here or here to here and then come back here, come back here and come back to the amide proton and detect it. This is exactly the strategy what we used in the HSQC toxi or HSQC nosy. 
we went from the proton to the nitrogen and we came back to the proton to observe it. Now we are doing 3 different things here, we go from the proton to the nitrogen and you also have the frequency label there and from the nitrogen you go to the carbon to the both the carbon CRC alphas you also have a frequency label there. So, you need to generate another independent time variable and after that you come back here, come back here and come back to this and you generate a uh, uh, detect the proton signal ok. So, now this is called as the HNCA. Now, uh, the next experiment here is the HNCOCA, there are so many different kinds of experiments here and uh, uh, the, the red labels, the ones which are nuclear marked red are the ones where you have uh, the frequencies labeled ok. So, in this case you have the proton, the nitrogen and this uh, C alpha, notice we do not go to this C alpha, we go to this C alpha, how do we do it? because we go we in this case we went directly from the nitrogen to the C alpha, we transferred magnetization from the nitrogen to the C alpha, here we do not do it, we transfer from the nitrogen to this carbonyl, we transfer to this carbon and from this carbon we transfer to this C alpha, therefore there is no question of going to this C alpha at all, this provides a kind of a directionality in our uh, assignment procedure, from this amide proton we go to this nitrogen from this nitrogen we go to this carbonyl, from this carbonyl we go to this C alpha, then we come back to this carbonyl, come back to the nitrogen and then to the proton for detection, we detect the signal on the on the proton ok. So, here therefore in the 3 axis what are the 3 axis we will have again proton, nitrogen and C alpha, but this is C alpha only now ok. Now, you do another trick here, this, this experiment you have the amide proton the nitrogen and the carbonyl, you label this carbonyl, come back to the nitrogen and detect this on proton. Therefore, we label these 3, here I have proton, nitrogen, carbonyl, these are the one peaks which will appear in your spectrum. So, likewise you have various possibilities of uh, transfer pathways and this is manipulated by using different kinds of pulse sequences, we are not going to go into that one. But we see, we know the principles how to transfer magnetization from one nucleus to another nuclei, another nucleus and we simply apply those principles here. So, what we do in this experiment, so we transfer from the amide proton to the nitrogen, from this nitrogen we transfer to the C alpha here, this C alpha as well as this C alpha, this is the same as this, this is the same as that. Now, what we do from the C alpha, from the C alpha we transfer partly to this nitrogen and partly to this carbonyl, partly to this carbonyl and now we put the red label on this carbonyl, we are not putting the red label on the C alpha as we did in this particular case. So, we use this is the mediator here as the C alpha come to the carbonyl and then we from the carbonyl we go back to the C alpha then back to the nitrogen same here C alpha carbonyl to the C alpha then to the nitrogen then here. Therefore, these ones have different kind of information as um, you will see and similarly you can also do that on the side chains of the individual individual amino acids. This is called as the HNCACB or correspond on the HNCOCB on these are various experiments which are designed to walk through the amino acids different carbons in the same amino acid residue ok. So, in this case we actually start from this beta protons here from the beta protons we start we come to this C alpha here and then from the C alpha we transfer to the nitrogen, from the nitrogen we transfer to the amide proton and we detect the signals here. Therefore, what are the signals we detect here? We detect C betas, the nitrogens and the and the amide protons. We finally detect the signal, always notice we detect the signal on the amide, we do not detect the signal on anywhere else because the amide protons are very distinct and we can easily identify those ones there. In this particular case you again start from the C beta, beta protons here, from the beta protons you go to the C beta carbon, from the path you go to the C, C alpha here and then from the C alpha you go to the carbonyl ok. And unlike here from this C alpha we went to the nitrogen directly, but here we do not do that, we go from the C alpha to the carbonyl from the carbonyl we go to the nitrogen, from the nitrogen we collect onto the amide proton and therefore this is called as and what is written inside here 
is what is written inside the bracket is these are the ones which are on the pathway these are there on the pathway but we actually do not detect those signals ok. Detecting means we have to have a frequency label and the T1 increment should correspond to that particular chemical shift and that is what determines which nucleus you are going to detect ok. So, yeah. And then the CBCA, CO, and H. So these were the HN protons. Okay. Now here, what we do, we start from the C beta once again, from here to here. So we have uh, from the C beta, you come here. From the C, uh, C alpha also, you start here. You also start from the C beta. So both the things will come here, and from this you go to the nitrogen, and from the nitrogen you go to the amine proton, and we detect the signal here. Okay. So, in this in these two experiments you can also start from the amide you actually in fact start from the amide proton, amide proton to the nitrogen, nitrogen to the carbonyl, carbonyl to the C alpha, from C alpha you go to the C beta and then from the C beta you go back to the C alpha, then to the C carbonyl and to the nitrogen and, and to the amide proton and detect it here. Okay. So, you can do that uh, either way. So, therefore, this kind of a, these are called as out and back uh, sequences. So, different kinds of strategies one can use to achieve the your uh, magnetization transfers. Okay. All this the way you the way you start and where you end will determine the way you design your pulse sequence. Okay. From way, whether you want to start from the alpha proton or the beta proton or from the NH protons and where you would finally come back and detect it that is but ultimately you always want to detect on the uh, amide protons. In this particular experiment you see two amide protons here. So, you have this NH proton as well as this NH proton. So, you have this ones coming once again it goes through the same pathway go from here to here, here to here and here to, and you also can go from here to here or you can go from C beta to this then from here you can go here then so these are all out and back pathway and from here you start from the C alpha you go to this nitrogen as well. So, you have uh, transferred to the um, uh, NH proton at this point. Okay. So, this is I uh, explained that in a little bit more uh, explicit manner in the few of these experiments here. So, you have HNCA, HNCOCA, HNCO these ones provide a crucial uh, assignment strategy here. In this CBCA CO NH experiment this is much more uh, clearly indicated in this uh, slide than in the previous one. So, in this experiment you see you start from the uh, H betas, from the H betas you go to this C beta, from the C beta you go to the C alpha, then from the C alpha you go to the carbonyl and in this you can also uh, the some portion of the magnetization will come from the H alpha also because the H alphas and H betas which are rather difficult to distinguish with regard to the chemical shift the pulses will apply to both. So, therefore, it will come from here to here as well and then from here to here as well both the things will happen. Then you go to the NH pro amide uh, N15 and then to the NH proton and for detection here. And in this particular case the CBCA, CO, CBCA NH you have the um, uh, starting from here H beta or H alpha you come down to the C alpha is it a two step process here H, uh, H beta to C beta and then to the C alpha and from here also you go to the C alpha from C alpha you go to the nitrogen and and from this C alpha you also go to this nitrogen and you collect the signal as amide protons chemical shifts at this point. Therefore, these will establish correlation what correlation do they establish they will establish correlations between uh, within the same amino acid residue up to the C beta carbons. But you see this experiment will also establish a sequential correlation because it has the two amide protons involved here of two consecutive residues. This is one residue here and this is the next residue here. So, therefore, you will establish correlations not only within the same amino acid residue but from one residue to another amino acid residue. Okay. Now, these experiments are uh, dependent on the transfer pathways and how is the transfer occur? The transfer occurs through the J coupling and the J couplings are uh, these are all one bond J couplings, one bond J couplings and these numbers are indicated here. See the one bond ad advantage is on one bond or two bond the advantage is 
th these are not dependent on the conformation of your protein and these are always the same. Therefore, there is no question of missing a correlation here in this kind of experiments here. So, you have this uh, various coupling constants that are indicated here these are the carbon carbon coupling 35 hertz carbon proton coupling is 140 hertz this coupling this C alpha CO coupling is 55 hertz and carbon nitrogen coupling this one bond is 15 hertz this two bond coupling nitrogen C alpha is 4 to 9 hertz and then one bond nitrogen C alpha coupling is 7 to 11 hertz nitrogen to proton coupling is 90 to 95 hertz. All of these do not vary depending upon the amino acid do not vary too much on the conformation depending on the conformation therefore you will not miss any correlation. Unlike in the case of nosis where you can miss a correlation if the distance is longer if uh, uh, kind of a motion is such that you are not able to see ANOE but here you will not miss any peak. Therefore, this is an extremely useful strategy to obtain sequence specific resonance assignments and for large proteins reasonably large proteins which you could not handle through the nosis spectra because these are using making use of the amide N15 and carbon chemical shifts all the three chemical shifts are used and therefore the dispersion is enhanced and you will not miss any uh, uh, assignment. So, okay. so, we will stop here and we will explain a little bit more about this some of these pulse sequences to give an idea of how the transfer happens in these pulse sequences as an illustration. We are not going to discuss every experiment in this but I will take some two illustrative experiments to show you how the manipulation is done through the pulse sequence. I think we will stop here.